Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this recording of Tableau Conference on Tour session. I'm Andy Cotgreave from Tableau, and I'd like to introduce and hand over to Matt Francis from the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, who is going to talk about Once Upon a Tableau. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Andy. So, thanks for taking the time to uh, listen to this uh, talk. I hope you find it informative and uh, interesting. Uh, so, hi, my name's Matt, and I, by day, I work at, here at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, which is a large genome sequencing centre nestled in the heart of the Cambridgeshire countryside. And uh, I work in this office here, and I work as part of the DNA Pipeline Group, and we provide a central DNA sequencing resource to the scientists and faculty members on the site. My primary role is to uh, produce dashboards and reports using Tableau on the various data sets that we produce in our limb system that tracks DNA samples and experiments that happen on them as they flow through the pipeline. So examples of this would be uh, we use uh, some reports to detail uh, what kind of modifications instruments have had, we use some dashboards to monitor the health of uh, some of our labs, so make sure that the temperature variation isn't too bad. We use them to monitor uh, running machinery, work out uh, when a machine's going to finish their current run, when they're going to need to be serviced. So this one here says these runs, these machines are currently running. The red line is, to, is uh, right now, and the coloured bars show um, the percentage complete of each individual run. So the people that run the teams and these instruments know when they have to go and actually serve the machine, when they, when they need the next lot of uh, data to get put on the machine, and uh, to keep the facility running to its optimum level. We have dashboards that are used by project managers, so they can see who are our biggest customers, and the beauty of Tableau means that you can show a lot of information in a very easy way, and allow the, um, the managers themselves to order the data, so if they want to know in terms of the actual amount of data or the number of um, sequencing runs that we're putting through, they can configure all this themselves. They can also monitor our, all our instruments to make sure we're utilising it to the fullest. So we have dashboards that look back over the last sort of six months, the last 24 hours, to say um, how often a particular machine is being used. Are we over capacity? Are we under capacity? Do we need to order new instruments? Or do we need to buck up the scientists who are actually not giving us the data that they're going to? So it's useful on both uh, sides of the fence. And we have a lot of dashboards that look at the quality of the data. We always want to define our processes, make them work better. And not only use real-time reporting, we have some warehousing where we can go back and look at the data that's produced over the last six months, years, two years, three, whatever time period. And look for variations in certain lab processes. So we can design experiments to improve the data quality and get better value for money. Uh, but by night, um, you might have seen some of the videos that I've posted um, online, so AI Gangnam style. Uh, we've had some grumpy felines. And of course, what happens when Hitler wasn't allowed to install Tableau? Uh, I also have a blog called Wannabe Data Rockstar, where I blog about various data viz things. Um, and I put out one or two tweets, and I don't really sort of speak that much. Uh, I've posted the odd viz or two to Tableau Public. Um, so I did one on November um, last year, so in how it's kind of grown, grown from a, a very small affair in. Um, Australia to become this sort of big global uh, movement. I did a fine advent calendar with some of the faces who are sort of prominent on social media last year. And at the beginning of the year, I did this dashboard to show just how many calories you have to burn off after you've been down McDonald's for that blowout. And it's a lot more than you uh, think it is. So briefly, I just want to say a little bit about Tableau Public because it really is fantastic. So, you know, what is so good about it? Well, the first thing to say is it's free. It's absolutely free. It'll cost you nothing. You can go to the Tableau Public website and you can download a copy of Tableau Public. 
and it has all the functionality of Tableau uh, Desktop, the full paid for version, um, and every single function that you get the paid version, or the calculator field, or the filters, or the parameters, everything you do on it, you can do with Tableau Public. The only limit is you're limited by the data sources that you can use in it. So you can connect it to um, Excel sheets or to CSV files, but uh, there is a limit that you can only have um, a million rows of, of data. In most cases, that's probably going to be enough. And upwards to uh, a gigabyte in size. But it's free. That's the big take home message here that it's totally free. So you're getting this full price product for nothing. It's fantastic. Um, you can then post all of your data visualizations onto the Tableau Public server, which is hosted by Tableau, it doesn't cost you anything. And then you can share that with anybody in the world who's got a, a browser. And it's used by a lot of bloggers. Uh, will have their blog and they will post um, their data visits onto there. It's used extensively by the um, by the media. You see it appearing on a lot of news uh, websites, New York, um, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, the BBC, case, New Guardian use it quite a lot. And a lot of charities use it as well because charities get an awful lot of uh, data and they need to kind of share it with somebody, um, share it sort of with the outside world. And it really can be used by anyone. And it is one of the best, if not the best, learning resources that there is for Tableau. The reason for that is, is that any dashboard that you see that somebody's posted on Tableau Public that you think looks interesting or has got a particularly sort of good design, you sort of look at it and say, oh, I like the way they've, they've sort of used that color scheme or they've done that on there. Anything that you sort of look at and think, wow, you know, that's really quite amazing. And how on earth did they manage to get that, that to work? You know, my dashboard's done it. How on earth did they? Um, you get this um, sort of feature to work. Well, on every single dashboard that you see, you can download it locally to your machine. You can then pick it apart and really find out how they created this masterpiece that you were so enamored with. And then you can attempt to rebuild it yourself. And that really is the best way of learning is to find something else that you like to look of, try and rebuild it yourself. And then that way you then understand all the little mechanisms inside it, all of the calculations, all of the thought processes that, that went into designing something. And then that way you then learn. And in by doing some of these more um, sort of abstract and fun things, you can then develop a lot of um, skills that you can then take back to the work. And so it really is a good um, learning tool in that respect. And, and in case you didn't pick it up earlier, Tableau Desktop um, Public is free. So why am I going to talk about stories? So what's so great about data storytelling? You know, it's a bit of a um, buzzword at the moment. It's kind of been um, a lot of interest. So why? What's so great about stories? So this quote here kind of sums it up really, that um, stories are a fantastic way of conveying information. And there's very good reason for that. There's a reason why stories are such a good communication tool. Firstly, they're much more memorable. If you think back to all your childhood memories, most of them have got a story attached to them. So that time you fell out of the tree because you were chasing your brother up there or you were trying to get the ball down or uh, something happened. There's always a story behind it. You'd never remember the single incident in isolation. You always remember the things that led up to it and the things that led after it. You got in trouble or this happened or that happened. Oh, do you remember the time so and so did this? Do you remember the time that happened on there? So stories are a very powerful way of conveying information and remembering it. And in fact, a lot of the memory challenges that people do one of the techniques they have there is to visualize um, a walk through, say, like, like a hotel. And as they pass each room, they imagine items within the room and they build up this mental image of them um, traversing through a, an environment and remembering things as they go. So memory and visual, visuals and memory have a very strong, um, strong link. So in the same way that stories can be much more impactful. If you give somebody just a dry set of statistics or numbers, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. But if you convey it in a story and say how they relate and put it in some kind of context, it can be much more impactful. It, in the same respect, can also be relatable. You know, if you say to somebody, you know, if you just, just as an example, if you talk about numbers, if you talk about sort of hundreds or thousands, you can kind of picture how big a hundred is or how big a thousand is. You might be able to picture a million. 
But when you get above a minute, you start talking into billions or billions and billions. You just can't imagine that number. It's too big. You need some way of kind of put it into context. And by having a sort of story, you can kind of build a narrative around it so you kind of make it much more relatable to people in their day-to-day -day lives. So one of the um, things I found when I was looking into this topic was this idea of sequential art, um, which was coined by a comic writer in the early sort of 1980s. And it kind of fits quite well with sort of the visual idea of storytelling. So storytelling and visually, it's always been about transmitting the human experience through kind of some kind of visualization. And if you go right back in history, the earliest example of this is kind of cave paintings. But these are visual representations of things that were going on at the time. So you have these very ancient peoples trying to um, convey stories, things that were going on. And they did it in a visual style. So, you know, this could be the earliest form of data, visualis um, sort of data visualization. It certainly predates sort of the written language. It's the first time to actually visualize um, their lives that were going on. You move forward into the, into the Egyptians, where they did it in a much more formal style, but in a much more formal and repeatable style. And again, showing their day-to-day -day lives and conveying the story through images which would later be refined into hieroglyphics, where you had repeatable symbols and images, which would then become the language. So in Rome, you have a lot of these um, triumphant columns. This is Trajan's column in Rome, which depicts um, his battles in the uh, Dacian Wars. And you have this sort of 30 meter column of this frieze that wraps round and round uh, about uh, 130 meters long, I think. And each panel depicts all these events going on, but it tells it in a sequential style. So you start at the bottom, you wind your way up to the top, and you see all these little individual um, uh, pictures that kind of build into this narrative story that kind of flow from one section to the other. Close to the home, we have the Bayer Tapestry, which tells in the story of the Norman in, in, um, invasion. Again, he's using these kind of sequential panels to tell this, this story. And even right up to date, comic books still use that same kind of style of a series of, of patterns together to kind of convey the story. So there's a long tradition of this kind of idea of this sequential um, storytelling. So maybe we're now moving into this era of sequential data visualization, using data to tell a story. I heard this great quote from um, Ellie a few weeks back, and it really does kind of sum up the real power of storytelling. Because you can have any kind of static report, um, and it can tell you the, the state of things that they are right now, or how they were, or what kind of processes happened sort of during the working week. And it tells you the facts. But it doesn't necessarily tell you the story behind it. It doesn't tell you why this is the case, why it is there. So the value in stories is it explains the reason why we are where we are. And that's a really great um, sort of thing to bear in mind as we go forward. A famous example of this, I mean, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a new thing, and one of the most famous examples is, is our friend here from Charles Minard, and I know um, a lot of people have talked about before. And this is a great example of storytelling using data. So it tells the um, Napoleon's disastrous invasion of Russia, and it encodes some really useful information. You've got the size of his army when he set off, and the size of the army as it was when it eventually hit Moscow. And then the retreat and how the thickness of that line just gets less and less and less and less and less. So even without going into the detail, you can see that the numbers of soldiers that left, you know, hardly anything that sort of came back. But what the real part about tells so much about the story is that on the advance to Moscow, they obviously had some trouble, but then coming back, the line still gets thinner. And what Charles did was added on the bottom part there is the temperature. And the unfortunate thing was is that on the retreat back, they were hitting some really horrible weather that then finished off the majority of the people that were still left. So by adding all this data together and creating this narrative, you take what would have been a very um, sort of static sort of spreadsheet, if you like, of, of data, but by putting this narrative in here, putting the, um, the locational information here, putting the temperature information here, you can build up from one visualization the story of this disastrous campaign, and it adds a lot more impact because they're not just numbers anymore. Now you actually you can actually see the march 
much of the army as it went across. So there's two kind of things we can look at. So there's a data of this and a data story. So kind of like, you know, what's the difference between the two of them? So firstly, what makes a data viz a data viz and not a data story? Well, a data viz in general is going to be unbiased and it's generally going to be impartial and there's not going to be an agenda to it. It's probably going to be neutral. And what that means in practice is you're essentially saying, here's some data. And that could be some historical data, some live data. We're just saying, here's a big chunk of data. And we're going to present it in a certain way, and here are some tools to look at it. We're going to use a uh, bar graph, we're going to use a line graph, we're going to use a tree map, we're going to use some bullet chart. It doesn't matter what it is, but here's some tools we're going to use. We're then going to give you some filters and some parameters, and off you go. Find out what interesting thing you can see in it. Go and explore. Here are your tools, here's your map, here's your compass, off you go. Go and see what interesting thing you can find, can find in it. So an example of that would be a dashboard like this. So we've got a, a map here showing some sales data, and we've got some parameters, so we can look at the data in terms of sales, or we can look in terms of profit. We can look at the sum or the count, not the average. And we've got some regional information down here, and we've got some actions. So we can click on uh, one part of the dashboard, and the other two kind of reflect the changes going on there. So we can look at this, and we can sort of, we can look in the south, and we can say, oh yes, you know these all look quite good. This one doesn't look quite as good. What's happening in Mississippi? Obviously, we're making a loss over here. Now we didn't know that until we started exploring the data. So we've kind of come to the data set in an unbiased view. We've been presented the data, presented the tool, and it's up to us, the viewer, to actually go and find the story that was within it. A data story, on the other hand, is slightly different. So it's designed to tell a story. It's designed to lead us somewhere. We want to take the viewer on a little journey. We want to say, here's some data. Again, doesn't matter what it is. But look at it this way. I want to show you this. Apply, if we apply this filter, if we delve into it this way, look at this. Now see how it affects this. Now look at it this way. What we're trying to do is we're trying to influence them. We're trying to guide them along a path that we want them to see. We want to show this particular interest that we found in the data. We might want to give them convey some kind of emotional response. We want them to feel a certain way about the data. The reason for that is that maybe we're trying to make a case for change. Maybe we're saying that uh, our, our capacity is at 95%, and if we keep on going, we think we're going to reach overcapacity in two months, therefore we need to increase the number of machines that we've got. So you're trying to make a case, and you're using the evidence and the data to say, this is where we are, this is where we want to go to, and I'm going to lead you through the data to get to that point. So essentially, you're taking a guided tour now. You're leading them, you're taking them by the hand, and along the way, you're kind of showing them the sites on where you want to get to. In order to do this, you need to plan your story out. You need to know um, a few things in order to be successfully telling some data um, stories. The first thing you've got to do is you've got to consider your plot. What is it I actually want to show? What is the starting point where we currently are? You know, where where is the um, where is the information that we've got at the moment? Where is that leading us? Where do we want to get to? What is it that by the end of this story I want people to either think or feel or decide or what's the kind of the, the, the end point? We then need to consider our characters, and this is going to be our data, our dashboards, our uh, filters, our parameters, all of the little bits that we're going to use to interact together in order to drive the plot forward, to bring the viewer along with us. And we need to consider our audience. Who are we presenting this to? Who's going to view it? What level are they at? Are we producing something for the board for the board to look at? Are we presenting something for somebody uh, who doesn't understand the business or doesn't understand the data? How much information do we need to convey in? Do we assume they know everything, or do we assume they know nothing? It's a good idea to actually storyboard your story um, when you're making it. 
And a good rule of thumb is to use the similar kind of technique that they use in storyboarding for films or, um, or novels. So you consider kind of having three acts. So your first act is the setup. So this is where you lay out and say, this is what uh, the purpose of this story is. So we're going to use this data and we're going to show this bit of information on here. So that leads into the second act, which is where, which is the action. So this is where the majority of your, uh, the bulk of your work in the dashboard, in the dashboard story is going to be. So this is where you're going to say, using this filter, we can see that this, you now using this filter, we can see that. And see how this affects this and how this affects that. So that's going to be your bulk of it, which should then lead into the third act, where you kind of sum everything, summarize everything together and then say, and this is what we, we find at the end of it. And if you think of the story in those kind of three acts, it allows you to create an effective story and then lead the viewer to where you want them to go. So I'm going to show you some examples of uh, my own storytelling that I've done uh, recently. So these are three um, dashboards that got published on uh, Tableau Public over the last few months. And I'm going to explain why I made them as stories and what design choices had to be made in order to make them effective um, as stories. So first I'm going to show is uh, looks at sunspots. So sunspots um, are a phenomena that's seen on the surface of the sun and they've been viewed for hundreds and hundreds of years and you can look at the surface of the sun you see very dark spots and sunspots are associated with cosmic rays which are high energy particles that are released from the sun that hit the earth there's billions of them hit the earth you know every sort of minute and every day and the amount of sunspots is also linked to the amount of irradiance which is that solar energy that's thrown out by the sun that again sort of hits the earth and the amount of heat and energy that the earth gets affects global temperatures and in the same way global temperatures then affect the weather patterns. So what I wanted to show was the correlation between these, these four different um, things and show how one kind of drive, drives the other. Um, in order to do this I had to then explain the significance of each of these particular steps and assume that the viewer had no prior knowledge of sunspots or solar irradiance. So this is what I came up with. So I used a very tall uh, dashboard in this in this case. So first of all, a little preamble, and then so here we have the average daily number of sunspots and an annual moving average uh, for the last sort of hundred years or so. And you see, there's this quite nice cyclical um, pattern. And then we scroll down, and then I showed the uh, solar irradiance, which is the amount of energy coming by the sun. Um, which we've been collecting since about 1978 when we have actually had satellites up there recording it. And then similarly, we've got the amount of cosmic rays and the global temperatures. And then finally, to kind of sum it all, to, sum it all to, together, so it's kind of a third act, I then created this dashboard with these two parameters, which lets people select the measures to kind of um, compare against, to actually kind of see uh, how well they all uh, line up. So what was the reason for using the tool dashboard? Well, all of the charts are related in that they've all got a common x-axis, which is years. And the thing that I wanted to convey over more than anything else was the fact that there's an 11 year cycle of sunspots. If you look back over hundreds of years, there's this very nice um, uh, cyclical period that's 11 years between the highest number of uh, sunspots and the lowest number of sunspots. And this cycle matches the irradiance, the cosmic rays, and you can then see the same pattern within the variation within the global temperatures. So the fact that you had this commonality between all of the charts meant that naturally one chart kind of flows into another. And that meant that that created a natural narrative that you could then follow through. And then the final part was having the comparative dashboard at the bottom, which then lets the user compare the different data sets together to kind of prove what they've been told. So I've been saying this relates to this relates to this. And then by allowing them to overlay each of the data sets, it kind of drives home that conclusion, the thing that I wanted to show um, in the first place. 
So the second uh, example was uh, based on some Formula One uh, driver data. So this was made as my entry for the sports iron bids uh, entry uh, earlier this year. And I went to ask the question, who's the greatest F1 driver um, of all time? So in order to do that, I went to compare some different qualities that all the drivers have, some different numbers, so the numbers of pole positions, number of race wins, numbers of points scored, and ultimately try and answer this, this question. So this is what I came up with. Um, so I created this dashboard and I created these navigation controls um, to allow you to navigate um, through this. So this is all using, this is, uh, these thumbnails down here are all individual dashboards, and you can click on here and you can navigate um, through. We can go back and forwards. And this took an awful lot of work to get this um, working correctly, especially generating all the thumbnails and kind of linking it all together. Uh, but it did quite well. It got into the, the second round of the live voting. Um, so I was pretty pleased with, with the, it's worth putting the, the work in. So why did I use pages for this? Well, well each chart is its own entity. Uh, there's not a direct correlation between the two. So the number of race wins doesn't, uh, number of pole position number of race wins are kind of like separate stats. Although one, they kind of relate that, you know, there's not a direct correlation between the two. So because we're not directly comparing the charts, it works well in pages. So you can have one page saying, here's this result, and then onto the next page, here's the next result, the next result, and so on. It did require the extra navigation, though, because you wanted to allow people to jump around the story. So, kind of, um, I've seen the proposition. I had to that relate back to this, so I could kind of jump back and forwards. Um, so that worked quite well. And lastly, uh, the last one that I did was uh, on malaria, which is done for World Malaria Day uh, this year. And what I wanted to show was that malaria is a global problem, um, but to many people, it's out of sight. You know, it's happening in Africa, it's happening in um, in sort of sub, in the tropics, and it doesn't really affect me on a day-to-day -day business, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, but I wanted to kind of try and bring home that it is this, this big sort of global problem, which meant I had to somehow put the data into context that people would understand. And there are some very big numbers in here, and. You need to make that relatable, like I said earlier. You want to make the data relatable to the people to drive them to get some real emotion. And even though they are very big, big numbers, each individual number is hides kind of an individual tragedy that's going on, which I really want to kind of get across. So this is what we came. This is what I came up with. So we get our our opening act, our um, our sort of setting out our story, and then I then showed the number of worldwide cases and how the number of cases meant that every single person that's in those 32 states in the US get malaria every single year. And that although of sort of in last year about 230,000 people, 90% uh, of the children have died, which is the equivalent of the entire population of the city in the US. And that kind of is quite impactful but then that then equates to 1700 school children and 30 school buses that leave and never ever come home again so I'm trying to use this kind of emotion to uh, try and use the data put it in this story to drive some kind of emotional response and then say you know here's what we've done prevent it you can get a, a mosquito net for sort of ten dollars but what could you spend ten dollars on instead instead you go and get some Dunkin Donuts you go and get some Fancy hot wings, or you could actually save a family's life. So for this one, I really wanted to get some kind of emotional impact out of the story that I wouldn't be able to get from just doing a, a normal um, this. And by using the state population, I wanted to show that this is a big, big thing. You know, if it was happening, if this happened every year in the US, would things be different? You know, would there be a greater um, would people, you know, really want to sort of do more to more to help? Having a city population, now if you saw that every person in the city that you currently live in wasn't there next year, you'd want to do something about it. And using the fact that the school bus as well kind of drives home that this is a problem that affects kids, you know, under fires 
shouldn't be dying in this sort of day and age through something that's entirely preventable and curable. But what it also had to do is kind of give a solution. It's no point just giving all the bad news. You have to give um, some kind of hope. So this is very much an exercise in getting emotion to drive change, making people feel a certain way in order to um, to make them want to kind of kind of help. So again, why not use a tool format? Or why experiment with doing the flicking pages again? But I thought it kind of lessened the impact because I wanted people to kind of get very emotional for it. And one thing to leave the other link love to kind of make you realise that this is a big story, but there is a kind of not necessarily a happy ending, but there is kind of at least some hope at the end of it. And I wanted people to feel these emotions. So I wanted to get emotions out of it. So I wanted people to be shocked that with the size of these numbers and to try, really sort of drive it drive it home. I want people to, you know, to get sad about the fact that you have this many kids are dying through something needless that we could prevent. And I want people to get angry that you know more isn't being done with this. And I wanted people to sort of care. I wanted you to think, you know, what is it I can do to help? I want people to feel hopeful that there is a solution that we could all um, we could all do. And you want to make people think, you know, I want to help. So. One of the great new features of Tableau 8.2 is story points. And this makes telling stories a whole lot easier. And now I'm going to try and give you some uh, demonstrations on how to create stories using Tableau. So we're going to do some live demos, which are always fun. And they always work seamlessly. So let's just cross our fingers. Uh, so I'm going to show three examples of creating uh, stories with, with Tableau. And the first one I'm going to show is um, combining some existing dashboards into creating a narrative. So for this one, we're going to use the Sunspot um, data that we had before. So here's what I've prepared earlier. So what I've got is I've got a uh, series of dashboards down here. So as a rule of thumb, I always, always use dashboards. Um, whenever I'm publishing anything, whether it's something for work or for the public, or again, anything with a story, always use dashboards, don't use sheets. The reason is, is with dashboards, you can control pretty much everything with it. You can control the layout, you can control the size, you can control the color, the position of everything. Like you get much more control. If you just publish a sheet, you're kind of, um, you have no control over it, and it's just how Tableau thinks you want, you want to do it, which might be right, it might be wrong, but doing a dashboard gives you control, which is always good. So we have our dashboards. We've got a, a title page here, kind of the title. Uh, so we've got a title page to set that story. We've got a bit of an introduction, saying, you know, the preamble saying what this um, story is going to tell. And then we've got the uh, dashboards that we saw previously in the very big uh, long one that I've kind of carved up into their own separate um, instances. And then we've got our comparison one, one here. So let's build this into a story. So we say we want to make a new story, and we simply here's our list of all of the dashboards in here. If I had sheets in here, you'll see the sheets, but I don't. They're all tied up in the in the dashboard, and we just drag it onto here to create, create our story, and we can give our caption something like this. And now we want to make the next one. So we could create a new blank story point. And then we could drag our next one to here. For example. And then we could drag our next one in. We could drag it onto here within the, the storyboard itself and drop it in there. And we can keep adding our dashboards as we go along. I just keep adding them in like this. And temperatures. But what we can do is we've realized, oh no, in actual fact, we want to put this one in after our cosmic rays. We want to slot this one in here. We just pick it up, drag it, and drop it into there. You can say, no. 
And then finally we put our Explorachi one in here. Explore the data. Give it a snappy title. And there we go. So we've now got our dashboards all linked together in our story. We've got a nice little navigation bar up here. We can navigate through it. And we can then see how uh, sunspots relate to cosmic rays, solar radiance, and everything else. And at the end, we've got our dashboard here, which we can filter out and play the parameters. So great thing is, is that stories allow you to link all these dashboards together into one cohesive narrative. All of the dashboards are just like a normal type of dashboard. So we, we, we hover over, we can highlight things, we can zoom, we can exclude, we can do everything that we can do with a normal um, dashboard, except it's all kind of wrapped up in this really nice um, uh, narrative uh, structure at the top here. So the second example is uh, exploring a single dashboard. So for that, we're going to go back to looking at our sales data uh, dashboard that we have. So we've got our exploratory dashboard, and we're going to see what interesting things we can find in here, because we want to share that information with somebody else. So let's create ourselves a story. And we're going to drop the sales dashboard into here. And we're going to start exploring. So the first thing we want to do is we notice that Montana's profit is in the negative. So we want to have a look into that. So actually, no, let's. So we'll start off with our initial dashboard. So. Here's the sales data. Okay, so now we want to actually start exploring. So we use the duplicate. Now we've got a duplicate copy of that original dashboard. So now we say, right, let's have a look at Montana. Montana doesn't look great. What's going on here? So we see that Montana is losing a lot of money in home office. So we can. And then we can then. We can space that as a new point, and now we can carry on. So now we've got this one has been saved as a new point here, which I actually wanted to save on here, so we can get rid of this one and say, so we've got a point on here. And we can duplicate it again, and we can then say, we can look at the home office. And maybe we then want to say, OK, well, let's look at how does home office compare everywhere else? So maybe we want to duplicate our original starting one. And here, and say, OK, home office. In general, we're losing money here. Here's not too great, but we're doing great. Okay, here, so. And we can slowly build up this kind of story where we're looking at, when we look at the South, interesting home office. Again, Mississippi doesn't look great. So we'll save that as a new point, and we'll say, And again, it's that pesky home office that's causing us some real trouble.
So what we've done is by exploring that single dashboard, we've now created several versions of that dashboard. But we can now navigate through them. And any change that we make to one dashboard doesn't affect any of the other ones. So we could, here we're still looking in terms of, of profit. Maybe we want to look in terms of sales. You can see the sales are high, but there's obviously something going on here. Now what we could do is we could notice we have now this little update button in here. What I could do is I could update the state of this dashboard to reflect the fact that we now want to look at the sales instead of the profit. Or I could save as a new point. So if I save as a new point, sales. So now the only difference we have is where on here it says profit, on here it now says sales. So what we could then do is we could then use this in a meeting somewhere, and we could present this. Uh, some, we can present this story to our um, to our sales team and say that this is what we found out. We found out that in general here's our sales data. Let's look at one time that's losing money here. In general, this is okay. So now you've you've actually created a story from that data. So you've gone from the exploratory dashboard to the story dashboard in very small number of steps, but it's very powerful because now we actually have this, we can now go to ourselves and say, look, you need to concentrate on these two areas and sort out the problem from there. So the third example is we're just going to build a dashboard from scratch. And uh, last month, it was the uh, Electronic Entertainment Expo E3, which is a big video games conference that happens in LA every year. And it's where all of the big games companies like Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo make do big press conferences and announce all the new games and consoles they can be made over the next sort of year or two. And this generates an awful lot of traffic on, on Twitter. So I decided to harvest some of these tweets using uh, Scraper Wiki, which is a fantastic tool for gathering um, with us um, tweets and you get a really nice output and you can do some visualization stuff with it and I also used Alteryx to do some processing before it got into Tableau to add some uh, data fields, do some cleanup. Um, Alteryx is a really great tool for doing any kind of uh, data manipulation before you get it into, into uh, Tableau. So let's see what we can find from that. Uh, okay, so the original fields we've got from Twitter, from our scrape week, I've removed some of the ones that I didn't want to use. So we've got uh, the author, the date of the tweet, and we've got the ID and the actual text of the tweet, and we've got the number of records, um, which is unusual to count. So I've got 574,000 tweets were sent over this 24 hour period. So I'm just looking at the period between 7 pm on the 9th of June and the 10th, 7 p.m. on the 10th of June, and there were um, that many tweets. So one of the things we could do, we could say, okay, well, who was the author of these tweets? Who was tweeting um, during this press conference? And we've now got 157,000 people tweeting, and maybe we're interested in knowing you know, who are the top, who are the top tweeters. So we could, you know, we could say, well, okay, well, show me the top. Uh, the top 20 tweeters who tweeted the most. And there we go. That's uh, meant to be interesting. So we can now be known as our top tweeters. And what else can we find? Well, we've got data in here. So this is quite interesting. What can we find out from here? So we can look at the, uh, we can look at the time of the tweet. So Let's look in hours, and let's look at the retweets per hour. So then we see, oh, that's interesting. So we now see that there are three peaks of Twitter activity. That's quite interesting. And what's that due to? Well, that coincides with the time of the press conferences for Ubisoft, Sony, and Nintendo. So during their live press conferences, obviously, they get a lot more tweets. Well, that's interesting. Okay, so uh, which is which? How do we sort of work, work that out? Well, we could create a, so I created this custom field 
which is a uh, or create this group rather. And what I did is I know the time of the press conference. So I basically did a grouping to say any tweets that happened during this minute was part of this uh, conference and so on. So now we can drag this onto say here. And now we've got, we can now see the Twitter activities. So we can see that the Ubisoft press conference generated all these tweets and Sony generated these and it's done through Nintendo. So again, that's quite interesting. So we can in that tweets uh, press conference. And we could do some sort of stuff where we could look at the top tweeters on here. And set that to actually see it. Really. That fingers. And then if we you know, to, we could do something like field here, and then we could say, okay, when he do his tweet, we've only tweeted some here, some here, some here, and this person tweeted some here. Hasn't got any luck in Nintendo. Uh, just, just a one bit there, there. So we've got some kind of information on there, so we don't need to tweet, tweet up her. Uh, and one of the other, one of the other things, things that, that so, so I use, one of the things we use all is to add like interaction extra for the ID I did my search, search through tweets, tweets, and certain text and text tweets, tweets, fun of fun of game, game. Okay, so sorry for the audio cutting out there. So, um, one of the things I used Alteryx to do was to go through the data and look at the tweet text that was the message that people were actually tweeting and pull out the games that they were interested in. So, I got a list of all the games that were talked about during the press conference and got an Alteryx to basically say, does this tweet contain this, this word? If so, add the game information in there. So now we've got a list here of all of the games that were tweeted about during the conference. And we can look at the number of tweets that each uh, each game got. So we see the most popular game is one called None. So that was the placeholder to say, if, these, if this game wasn't being talked about, then uh, just say None, so I can exclude that out of there. And then we can see that the top game that was tweeted about was Legend of Zelda, first followed by Far Cry and Uncharted 4. And because we've got the original thing about the company name, we can color code that in there and say, during which person's press conference was that um, being released? Well, although Zelda is a Nintendo game, people were still talking about it um, outside of the, the press conference. So what we can now do is we could add that to our tweets. Okay. And if we wanted to, we could add that into our dashboard over here. So this person, again, he was tweeting about a few things. He was, you know, he tweeted a bit about everything. Whereas this fellow over here, here, was tweeting about these things over here. So you can kind of build this kind of story up over the number one here. But the other interesting thing is we've got this this uh, the date field on here. So if we actually look at the hourly rate again, if we actually go down into the per minute, we then see we've got all this activity on here. And what's quite interesting is if we now look at the terms of game, we can now see the tweets per game on a per minute basis. Uh, so Let's exclude that. So now we can see during the Nintendo press conference, we get all this activity talking about various games. Uh, but what we'd quite like to do, it'd be quite nice to just look at one particular conference. So what I'm going to do for that is I've got these calculated fields here. So we've got, uh, I've got a parameter. So I'll show the parameter. So we've got press conference parameter, which just is 
just a list of the company names. And I've got two character fields for the conference start and conference end. So if it's Nintendo, then set the conference start for this time. If it's Sony, Ubisoft set those times. And similarly for the uh, conference end time. And then we can then say, uh, if the press con if the tweet date is between these two conference times, then it's that particular conference. So we can add our true false parameter in there. And now we've now got a way of navigating to the individual press conference. So that's our Nintendo press conference, our Ubisoft, and our Sony one. And what's quite nice is that now means that we can see during the Nintendo press conference. This particular game here got the highest number of tweets per minute, which was Zelda, one of the popular ones. And down here uh, was Smash Brothers and right there. So we've now got our Twitter timeline. And now we've got some information here that we can actually build our, build our story. Um, so what we can do is we can create a new story and we can say so maybe the first thing we want to do is show our original numbers of tweets here so let's go back here so if we now uh, Here's all the tweets for E3. And we then want to duplicate that. And then we then say we want to add our game tweets. So this is what people were uh, tweeting about. So let's go back to here. I want to add our tweets for game. And then, so we want to now look at our timeline. Now, this is the reason why we use a dashboard rather than use a uh, sheet. I've just dragged the sheet onto here and it's automatically put the key in here, which I don't particularly want to have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that. Get rid of that, and we'll create a dashboard, and we'll put our Twitter timeline in here. So I don't want that, but I do want to have the press conference control. I want to have that as floating parameters that we can take up to that room. We can put that in there. So now we go back to our story. We've now got this dashboard here that we can then drag in. <laughs> so now we've actually got our our timeline how we want it. Let's set that to automatic. That will fit a bit better. So now we can change that. So we've got our Twitter timeline in here, and now we can say, see the tweets per game per conference and we could set that for the um, Sony one so let's save that as a new point and we could then change one to be the Nintendo one And we should do the same for the Ubisoft one if we wanted to. And so what's, for example, and then what we can also do is we can add uh, some description captions to these sheets. So this one in particular 
his favourite game of mine. So Grim Fandango is getting a uh, remaster re-release. So maybe I want to say on here. Because I'm particularly happy about this. And we can add that on there. And we can say that's a new point of the conference. So now we've got our little story in here, which you can now navigate through. So we've so here's all the tweets that were produced during the conference. Here's all the games that have been talked about, the top the top games that have been tweeted. And when we break it down, here's the tweets per game conference. And we can see the various bits in here. We've highlighted the fact that uh, we're excited about this. And here's the various things in here. So that's just a really quick, easy way of taking some data from Twitter, adding some extra value with some calculated field, and then using Alteryx to um, add some even more value and then create an interesting narrative from the data. So thanks for taking the time to listen to this. I hope you um, found it useful and informative. And if you want to know any more, please where you can find me.